people keep jumping on, uh, but tonight we have Dr. Chris Proctor, and he is going to be taking us through interseeding cover crops in corn. And if you have questions about implementing this on your farm, he's your go-to guy. He can answer those questions, and uh, he can take your questions in the chat. So if you type a question out, we can ask him and get you some answers. So hang on tight, and Chris, we're ready for you. So here we go. All right. I always get nervous when I'm called the go-to guy. Uh, that's a lot of pressure, but I'll do my best to answer questions as I know them, or at least point you to somebody that knows more than I do. How about that? Um, so I, yeah, I'm just gonna, at first I thought I had three hours and Megan told me I only have 20 minutes. So I think I need to talk fast, maybe. Uh, but, so all that to say, I, I just wanna, this is gonna be a, a highlight, if anything, of kind of interceding cover cropping. Um, this is certainly just one aspect of it. And I thought instead of, kind of doing the usual why I do cover crops. I'm going to assume that you see some value in cover cropping and so we can kind of jump jump in uh, beyond that. Uh, but if I, so when I just think of Midwest cover cropping and you know in Nebraska in particular, uh, there's just challenges with cover, cover cropping and corn soybean system. Uh, usually that's now there's pretty limited time for success, right? That window after you harvest uh, is pretty short, so you don't have a lot of time to establish a cover crop. A lot of people wonder whether uh, the benefits that, that we often talk about or, or recognize as being part of cover crop and whether or not the cost of the cover crop is, is worth the benefits. Um, and then, you know, there's always concern about, is there gonna be a, a yield impact uh, on my crop by having a cover crop in the system? Uh, and so those are all certainly concerns, um, but then I think, uh, how, how do we overcome those in our system, right? Because at the end of the day, we know that, that if we're gonna see these benefits, uh, uh, we really wanna generate biomass. And so the question is, well, how do we generate biomass? Well, we do know that planting day has a big effect on, on cover crop biomass. And so this was uh, one study, but there's a number of them that, that basically look the same. So this is over two different years looking at different planting dates of cover crops. Uh, and if you measure biomass in the spring, so that's the green bars, the earlier you plant, the more biomass you generate. And, and this was in uh, South Central Nebraska. And both years there was somewhere around mid-October, uh, you kind of see that there was a, a drop in, in cover crop biomass once you get past that mid-October. So that seems to be, uh, if, if you can make a broad generalization, a good, a good cutoff date for Nebraska in terms of if you're going to plant in the fall, if you can plant earlier in October, uh, uh, usually you get more biomass. So that'd be, I mean, so that's one, one way. Uh, I can show it visually, right? So this will be planted in September, early September versus late September, uh, early October, and then you go all the way up to late October, and you can just see that the later you plant, the less biomass you, you generate. You could flip the coin and you could, you could delay termination. So that'd be the other way to generate additional biomass. Uh, so if you terminate early, so this would be two weeks before, uh, in this case, this was uh, a May 15 planting versus terminating right at planting. So just an additional two weeks of growing season in May uh, can make a huge difference in terms of how much biomass you can accumulate. Uh, and so right, we know that when you have a short window and if you're trying to cram a cover crop in uh, between your corn and soybean systems, it's a challenge. There's little ways that you can tweak it, but we do know that the more time you give your cover crop to grow, the more biomass uh, you're gonna gain, which is kind of the, the, the take home. Um, and so a lot of, we often think, well, how do we overcome those challenges, right? How do you overcome that short season? Uh, there's a number of different ways that have been talked about. You could certainly add wheat to your rotation so that uh, wheat harvests a lot earlier than corn or soybeans, so that gives you a, a much larger window when it's the wheat year of rotation to add cover crops in. Uh, seed corn, same idea, right? So when the male rows are destroyed in seed corn, that opens up uh, opportunity for cover cropping. Silage, so that's harvested a lot earlier than, than grain. Uh, so you could uh, potentially cover crop there. Uh, you know, we've done some research looking at using shorter maturity groups of corn or soybean and so those would harvest earlier. 
uh, and give you a couple weeks additional uh, cover crop growing season in the fall. Uh, there's certainly a, a bit of talk about green planting, right? So that would be planting uh, soybean in particular, a little bit with corn as well, planting your uh, crop into a growing uh, a cover crop as a way to extend that season into the spring. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of others that I didn't mention that, that could be discussed as you know, how do you how do you provide opportunity to establish a cover crop uh, but then interseeding is certainly uh, uh, another one that uh, gets talked about and I think uh, e this is the one that seems to be uh, of most interest of late right? I think it's been talked about uh, more recently than maybe some of these other methods so I think as we learn more about cover cropping this has become one that I think people are are uh, thinking about trying uh, and so there's kind of two two opportunities for interseeding. So there's broadcast interseeding. So this would be with an airplane or a high clearance applicator. Uh, typically this would be late season. So this would be uh, R5, R6 growth stage in, in corn or right as soybean leaves are, are about to drop. So as the leaves are yellowing before they drop, you could go through and, and apply a cover crop at that time. Um, so it certainly extends the window, the season. Uh, the challenge is poor seed to soil contact uh is, is because you're just throwing the seed on top of the surface and then timing is really critical so if you don't get rain uh or or able to irrigate uh within a relatively short time of seeding uh your your establishment goes way down uh, versus drill interseeding and so this is i think what uh, has been talked about even most recently and so this would be uh, specialized equipment, so a drill interseeder. So this would be a high clearance drill that's able to clear uh, your crop without uh, injuring it. Uh, and usually the window of opportunity for this would be kind of that V3 to V5 uh, timing uh, in corn in particular. It's not, it's not as common in soybeans, so I have a note here, right? It's most common in corn. I think the challenge in soybean is the really dense canopy. And so uh, with, with any interseeding, light is, is one of the biggest issues is getting adequate light for that cover crop. Uh, but one of the advantages to this over broadcast interseeding is you do have good seed to soil contact. Uh, so with that, I just thought I'd highlight maybe a couple of considerations. So if you're thinking about drill interseeding in particular, you know, what are some things uh, that you ought to pay attention to? So timing of planting is, is really important, right? You got to catch that, that opportunity that that ideal window I think to be successful. Uh, so this was a study that was actually done in 2015 and it kind of preceded a lot of the excitement about these drill interseeders but I think it's worth showing because uh, it, it, it makes a good point. So this was this was actually broadcast interseeded but there was uh, five different um, planting dates of these cover crops uh, starting at V0. So Corn was planted, cover crop was planted at the same time. So this would be kind of the extreme. There was another one right at V8. So just as the canopy was closing, R5, R6, and then the typical post-harvest uh, uh, planted uh, cover crop. Uh, for this study, uh, again, there's the, the five different interseeding dates. And then there was uh, rye, radish, hairy vetch, and then the mix of all three of those together, the different cover crops that were used. Um, and so just in a nutshell, uh, what was found is uh, when cover crops are interseeded with corn, uh, corn yield tended to decrease, but for all the other planting dates, there wasn't really any effect on, on corn yield. So uh, I think that's where some of this opportunity uh, for drill interseeding comes into play is, is it delays interseeding just enough that, that that effect on corn typically isn't seen, right? And so most most work that's been done with it doesn't seem to see a, an impact on corn in particular. Uh, so certainly, again, uh, planting early into corn, you produce a lot of biomass. Uh, in this particular case, V8 uh, actually had the lowest biomass. And so I think this is where that timing becomes really critical. So this is where I want to highlight this. If you plant early, there's enough light for that cover crop to get up and going, but it's too early, so it hurts the corn crop. V8, you miss the window on the other side, it's too late. So that corn canopy was just closing. Um, and so, so before that cover crop could get up and going, that canopy closed over and that light 
became really limiting. And so actually that, that cover crop wasn't even there by the end of the season. And so that window between V0 planting and V8, right, that's not a very big window. And so you, you really got to, so that, and it's even narrower than that. So kind of that V3 to V5 is that ideal spot. So that doesn't give you much time to get in the field and do this application. So that's one of the challenges uh, uh, with this. Um, when you look at, at corn yield, you can see that um, there's pretty significant uh, yield impact uh, when you plant right at right at um, corn planting. And so that's why delaying that, that inner seed and bite it's a little bit is important. And so this is kind of what it looked like uh, when you plant right at. So you, you can see you got really nice establishment, uh, but look how stunted the corn is relative uh, to the, the, the corn without any cover crop growing. And so uh, again, timing is, is pretty important. Uh, cover crop selection. So this is something uh, I'm not, I, I'm pulling from a lot of different places on this one, right? I, I think we're starting to see more research, but I, at the same time, I think this is one of the limitations right now is, is people are trying different things. And, and so the question is what's, what's kind of the ideal uh, cover crop when you're planting it into another crop that it's going to survive that, that kind of that harsh environment, that low light environment. And so these are the cover crops that get talked about a lot. Uh, annual rye, uh, crimson clover, red clover, those are kind of the, the really popular ones that I hear about all the time. Uh, this brucine clover is another one. This daikon radish, so those are those, those oil seed radishes uh, do okay. Uh, hairy vetch, rape seed, turnip, cowpea. So these are all potential uh, cover crop species that could be used. Um, again, it's a challenging environment and I, and I think uh, there's still more that could be done, I think, to, to really understand what's ideal, especially for our Nebraska environment. So I think more growers are trying this and sort of slowly getting a better idea what this looks like uh, for Nebraska. But a lot of this stuff is coming from uh, east of us. So Indiana, uh, Pennsylvania, right? There's uh, more being done there. And then if you go up north, say into Wisconsin, they're able to do things up there just because of their cropping system and, and the intensity of their corn system. that's a little bit different than ours. And so uh, I think as you go north, CRI and oats become an option, and that could be true in Nebraska too, right? As we get into kind of northeast Nebraska, that might be true. Uh, but again, I think I'd like to see more more work in Nebraska before I put my big red stamp of approval on it. So, uh, kind of stay tuned. I think there's a more uh, as well as herbicide selection, right? So, again, we're we're kind of compressing all of these different components of the cropping system. And as soon as you do that, uh, things start to overlap and, and herb your herbicide program in particular gets kind of complicated. Uh, so let me just highlight a couple of things here. Um, right off the bat, when you're thinking about herbicides and cover crops, it's really important to distinguish between forage crop and cover crop. And I won't spend a ton of time here, but just know that if you're if you have any intention of foraging the crop that you're planting, the cover crop that you're planting, following the label requirements is, is incredibly important. So you can't, uh, if the label doesn't allow you to plant that cover crop, uh, if it doesn't explicitly say that you're allowed to plant that cover crop uh, at that timing, uh, then, you can't, then you can't use it for grazing. Uh, whereas if you're only gonna use it for a cover crop with no intention of grazing, uh, then there's opportunity to plant. Uh, it's it's this user's own risk, right? So so any failure that occurs due to the, the herbicide program on your cover crop that would be at your own risk. So that's just something to pay attention to. It's a good distinction to make when thinking about these things. Uh, so herbicide label, you got to pay attention to the label, uh, especially if grazing's uh, in the mix. All right, but I think I think you get some idea of, of maybe what, what you can do with your cover crops, right? So it talks a lot about replant, prevent plant restrictions, uh, grazing restrictions. Uh, most often cover crops fall into this other crop category, which simply means that the, the companies that labeled the herbicide didn't have the budget or, didn't, or they chose not to do any testing on the cover crop just because it's a, a minor crop and so the expense wasn't worth it. Uh, at the time the label was, was released. And so usually it's the longest, uh, it's the longest restriction that they're comfortable putting on the label. And I'll highlight that here in a second. Uh, so I think cover crops could go in earlier than, than the label recommendation, but again, it's at your own risk. Um, 
but here's something just to consider. So when you think about what herbicides can I select, there's a number of things that, that determine how long an herbicide persists. So certainly the rain, fall, fall soil texture, the organic matter, uh, pH of your soil, the rate of your herbicide application, the, the half-life of that herbicide. So all those things work together to determine how long does that, does that herbicide remain uh, active uh, in the soil. Uh, a couple other characteristics that are, that are important when it comes to herbicides. So water solubility. So the more soluble uh, an herbicide is, the more, more it dissolves in water and, and will move with water through the soil profile. Uh, and one place that this becomes uh, uh, potentially challenging is if you have heavy residue. You, know, you could have herbicides that hang up in the residue and don't make it to the soil. Or if you have um, if you're planting green, that would be another situation to pay attention to this, but also soil absorption. So how tightly do those herbicide particles bind to the soil? And you can see there's a huge range of how different herbicides perform. So just paying attention to that uh, is another thing to, to think about when selecting herbicides. Uh, but just to show a couple of labels and to show how widely they can vary. So this would be, uh, this is the window that's allowed, uh, that's required to rotate to the next crop. So if you spray, uh, soybean with Optil Pro, how long do you have to wait to plant one of these crops that are in this table here? Well, if you come down here and look at other crops, this has 40 months on there, right? So four, you have to wait almost four years before quote unquote other crops are safe to plant. And so if your cover crop doesn't fall on this table and you want to graze it, well, that's a 40 month, uh, that's a 40 month wait. If you're not going to graze it, uh, you can, I would think you can plant within 40 months and probably be okay. Uh, but again, that's a, at your own risk. Uh, whereas you, you compare that uh, to something like uh, Diflex Duo. Again, they have these same tables showing uh, rotations. This one only goes up to 18 months. What's interesting here is, and you're starting to see this on more labels, they're starting to have these cover drop uh, paragraphs on the label. And it, essentially what this one here says is that, uh, it's kind of at your own risk. Um, and they give maybe a, a window where you might be cautious uh, in planting, but at the end of the day, do it at your own risk. A lot of these recommendations, uh, these replant recommendations for different herbicides are summarized in, in the weed guide. At least I, I call it the weed guide, uh, the guide for weed disease and insect management. Uh, and so a lot of this could be referenced there. So if you don't have one, uh, it's a pretty handy tool to have uh, at your disposal. Another tool, uh, this is a NEB guide that was put together on, on a field bioassay. So this would be a way you could take some field soil and test the different cover crops and whether they would germinate or not uh, after, you know, when you're getting ready to make that, that cover crop. Planting relative uh, to what herbicide you put down, this would be a way that you could test that for yourself if, you, if you're unsure. The only disadvantage of this is it takes a little bit of time uh, for those cover crops to germinate and so if you're ready to plant tomorrow this wouldn't work uh, but this would be a way that you could you could test for yourself maybe how how those herbicides are hanging around uh, and this is the this is the last resource that i'm going to put in front of you and this is one that i go to most often right now i think penn state's done a really nice job of summarizing uh, different categories of herbicides and how they might affect different cover crops, uh, particularly in an interseeding situation. Uh, and so I think slowly we'll see more and more uh, of these tables come out as more research is done. Uh, but this is one uh, that I've seen that, that um, I think is most comprehensive. So there's been other ones out there, but this is the one I often reference. Uh, but essentially they, uh, they break it down into these tables. So this was showing uh, a grass legume mix and they just rank them by injury likely, injury possible, injury unlikely. And so when you get down to this unlikely category, you can see uh, your options become pretty limited. And so that's, that's the biggest challenge I think in this interceding uh, practice is, is your herbicide options become fairly limited where you're using products where you're confident that you're not going to have not going to have any issue. Uh, let's see. So then they also summarize it this way. So these would be uh, cover crops. These would be some herbicides that, that um, would be relatively safe to use. So these are post-emergent corn herbicides. Uh, so these are ones that you could apply just before planting of that interceding cover crop or 
or right after you plant, but before they emerge. These would be uh, uh, safe products to use uh, in that kind of situation. Um, and then these would be some, some products, some soybean products uh, as well. So you're gonna see they've summarized different herbicide products uh, uh, for some of these different situations for inner seeding. I, I think it's a pretty handy uh, bit of information uh, that I'll often reference uh, when I'm thinking about this. But again, it's a pretty small toolbox. And so, uh, again, I guess thinking about drill interceding, that early season interceding, um, there's a lot of things that have to go right. Or say other words, there's a lot of, uh, other way, uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong uh, when you're cover cropping in this way. Like it's a pretty intensive cropping system. So it's something you probably want to ease into. If you've never used cover crops before in your system, this is not probably the best place to start. Uh, I think just getting familiar with using cover crops and having that additional uh, management uh, piece in, in your system, I think uh, it's good to, to kind of get that going uh, before you jump in and, and start interceding at, at V3, V5. Um, but ideally, I think as you, as you work into it, you want to start in fields where you don't have really heavy weed pressure Right, where you have really, really heavy weed pressure, I think uh, given that your, your herbicide toolbox is so limited, you're asking a lot of those, those cover crops to suppress weeds and a lot of times you're gonna, the, the weeds will, will escape and, and cause problems for you. And so you want a field where you've managed weeds well, you don't have a huge seed bank. I think that also helps uh, have good success. Um, and then the last, here's the, I think this is my last slide actually. Uh, one or two other things that I think uh, come up when thinking about uh, interceding. So uh, corn populations, uh, another piece, right? So this all comes down to light, getting more light through the canopy for the cover crop. Uh, and so again, we're, we're overlapping systems. Uh, traditionally, you'd say we want to capture as much light as we can for that corn crop. But if we want to, if we want to get a cover crop up and going now, uh, uh, you're going to have to, you're going to have to compromise a little bit. And so maybe reducing your corn population below 36,000. Uh, or if you are gonna be at the higher end, selecting hybrids that have really upright leaf orientation, I think could help. Uh, North-South rows tend to allow more light uh, into the canopy than East-West rows. Uh, shorter corn tends to favor more light through the canopy than, than taller hybrids. And so those are just uh, another, another thing to consider uh, when thinking about inner city. So, I made it. I don't know if I did it in 20 minutes or not, uh, but that's just a, a brief overview of some things that I've been thinking about as it, as it pertains to interceding in corn. Okay, uh, so there, there is a question for you. There's two, okay. questions, actually. <laughs> okay, so were any of the studies conducted on irrigated or non-irrigated versus irrigated? Yeah, I. I think most of the, so again, most of this work has been done east of us where irrigation typically isn't necessary. And if anything, they might have too much water. So they're just dealing with very different situations than, than we do in Nebraska. And so uh, I would say, I, I would be fairly cautious to implement this system in a, in a rain fed environment in Nebraska. Let's say that because I think I think the chance for using too much water um, is relatively high. Aaron, I don't know if you'd add to that, right? Because I think you've done a little bit, maybe not with this interceding piece, but just cover crops and 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 in water use. If you'd add to that, yeah, you know, it's just the the challenge of you never know what our summer is going to turn into, right? So, um, you know, like right now, we've got some areas that are getting on the dry side. So um, it's definitely a risk you'd have to take. Yeah. Yeah, so it's something to pay attention to. I don't know if that answers the question. If not, please ask or follow up. But uh, I would be cautious in Nebraska, I think, without irrigation. OK, because the there was the follow up to that was just they were curious about what data there is on non-irrigated eastern in eastern Nebraska, both in terms of the biomass production and then the next crop yield. Yeah, so 
again, I, I feel like we're, we're pretty early in the game in Nebraska for drill interceding. So I don't have, I don't have data for drill interceding for Nebraska just yet. Uh, I will say this year at our soybean management field day, we are going to do some drill interceding into soybean. Uh, so we're going to look at that. Uh, and we're also going to do, I think we're going to start some corn interceding studies this year to look more at that, uh, which doesn't really help answer your question right now. Um, but I do know for our other cover, cover crop studies, we have had success in rain fed environments in eastern Nebraska. Uh, and I think the farther east you go and probably the farther south you go, uh, you know, you, you can be successful certainly. Um, but you're, you're much more reliant on the year. So we've had really outstanding years cover cropping under rain fed environments. Uh, 2016 comes to mind, or that was just an outstanding year for cover cropping. We had plenty of moisture and the temperatures were great. Uh, 2018, on the other hand, we had next to no cover crop biomass. Um, and you, you just have to be a lot more careful about when do you terminate, how do you transition from one crop to the other, uh, because the, the, the effect of that cover crop uh, it gets magnified into your next crop uh, if if water starts to become limited. Okay, uh, I got another one for you. So what are your thoughts on wider corn rows, so like 60 inch rows, to accommodate cover crops and corn? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, there was actually, was it this last year, Laura, or two years ago, there was an on farm research study looking at the difference between those two. Uh, and if I recall, um, the cover crops did much better in the wider rows, uh, but there, we weren't, they weren't quite able to uh, compete yield-wise in the wide row system compared to the narrow, the 30 inch row system. So there was a compromise there. So I, it would be one of those situations that if, if you could justify uh, the, the decrease in yield, uh, because of what you could gain out of that additional cover crop you were, you were gaining on the wide row system, it could be, there could be value there. Because uh, you certainly do increase the amount of cover crop biomass that you can produce in that, in that uh, setup for sure. I don't remember the yield difference exactly. I'd have to go look it up. Well, I think we'll have uh, follow-up links with some of these resources uh, and be able to highlight that for you. Uh, but I don't recall off the top of my head the yield difference, but I know there was one. Yeah, I actually happened to have it in front of me. Uh, there was about a, a pretty substantial, close to 50 uh, bushel difference, but the producer did point to hybrid selection and then the population um, as being some key factors, you know, to make sure you're getting something, getting that population right in that 60 Intro row spacing and then finding some hybrids that can withstand the populations and have some good flex. So definitely some other things to, to work out in the system there. Those, those plant spacing is like three inches, wasn't it, in the 60 inch rows? Like it was pretty, they were pretty tight spacing, if I remember right, within the row. So yeah, I mean, those are things that are worth, anytime you change these systems, that's, that's part of the issue we're finding even with cover cropping is you, you have the typical way that you'd manage corn. And if you don't change anything about the corn and you just add a cover crop, you're not going to be as successful as if you start to adjust your, your corn system and your cover crop system. I think wide row, narrow row, it's the same idea. If you're going to change your system, you need to adopt or adapt the, the hybrid, the population, right, to, to fit the, the new system and not just keep it the same. Laura, are there any coming through on Facebook for on your end? I got one more. Yeah, I don't have any. Go ahead with yours. Okay. Would you expect with the addition of a cover crop that you would see an increase in the degradation of some residual herbicides with the added or with the increase in biological activity? And would it matter enough to affect some of the labeled re or some of the labels with the replanting intervals? That's a tough. That's a that's a tough question right there. But no, I, it, I mean it's I, li I like the train of thought. Right, I think that I think I would agree with that thinking. In that we know herbicide break. That, like, there's all those factors that I mentioned, and biological activity is absolutely one of the the factors that is affected 
that affects how an herbicide breaks down. And so I could see if you have a really active soil, you know, you have a lot of biological activity due to having cover crops growing, that that, that could influence how those herbicides break down. Uh, absolutely. And so uh, that's as far as I think I can go with that. Other, other, I mean, I think, I, I think that's certainly a possibility in terms of saying, yeah, you have cover crops growing, it's going to change how long that herbicide persists from 10 days down to five. I don't think we have those kinds of numbers that we can put to it. Uh, but the concept, I think, is, is it makes sense. And I think that's right. Okay. And then there's one more question. Um, could you briefly talk about how to set up a cover crop interceding experiment on farm? Yeah, great question. I'm not the on-farm expert. I do know in one of our recent, uh, it's probably not even recent anymore, it's almost a year ago, we did a crop watch article on interseeding. So we'll certainly link to that uh, later on. Uh, but part of that article, we did have a protocol uh, developed for a pretty, I think it was just a simple uh, interseeding, uh, interseeding versus no interseeding comparison. Um, and so that's that's available on the on farm uh, research network website. Is that right, Laura? Yeah, I think we've got that on there, and there might be another one additionally that is set up for three comparisons where you could test a couple different mixes for yeah. interseeding. But it, and again, if you have a specific question that you're wanting to answer in terms of interseeding or something that you are really interested in testing, any one of us would be happy to. To sit down and think through that with you and, and help develop uh, uh, some kind of uh, protocol uh, that might fit fit your farm or your system uh, even better than than the ones that are out there. Those would be a good place to start, certainly. But I think uh, we could certainly we could uh, adapt it to to some of the questions you might have as well. Okay. So Gary Leswin. He just wanted to comment that a lot of people are doing this in an organic system. So, yeah, that's a good point, Gary. I think there's a lot more incentive doing it organic right now because of the weed control piece, right? And so I think paying attention to what what a lot of the organic growers are doing is is a great point. Chris, I got another question for you. All what right. are the planned projects for this year that will be involving either the interseeding or will revolve around integrating cover crops with uh, different herbicide programs. So I, I, I did mention the, the, what we're gonna do at soybean management field days. So there's four locations planned uh, this summer in August. And the way that, that one is designed, uh, it's looking at two different soybean varieties. So, uh, 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 one of, uh, I think a shorter, more open variety, trying to, again, trying to play with getting light to the canopy versus a more of a typically grown variety. Uh, and then looking at uh, just a typical soybean herbicide program, so not changing anything versus doing uh, a program that would fit more of those Penn State recommendations and seeing uh, how do those affect interseeding in soybeans. So that's one for sure that's on the books. Uh, and then we just we just uh, put in a, a submission, hopefully to get some funding to continue some of this some of this work, uh, looking at interseeding in corn, uh, which would start this fall, but looking at different intensities. Uh, so going from no cover crop to adding wheat, uh, to looking at uh, green planting, and then and then all the way up to uh, interseeding cover crops uh, using these drill interseeders and and how those different systems compare yield wise and, and looking at some different herbicide programs that might fit those different different systems. So that's in the works. I, uh, there's some things that we want to just try on a small scale. I think this this summer, uh, regardless, uh, here in eastern Nebraska. And I know there's a project up in northeast Nebraska uh, in, in kind of the Brazil region, uh, particularly interested in, in capturing nitrates uh, that are being lost out of the system. And and one of the pieces that they're looking at is using a, uh, one of these drill interseeders uh, as a way to get a cover crop up and going and, and to be able to capture uh, nitrate before it, it leaches out, uh, out of the system. 
Okay. I know, I'm sure there's more. Those are just a couple that came to mind. Well, so basically what you're saying is stay tuned because there'll be more soon. So Absolutely. Um, I think that's all we have for tonight. If there's any more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, but thank you, Chris. That was great. And next week we will be back at seven o'clock. Uh, and we will have Joe Luck, and he's going to talk through using precision ag technologies. Um, it'll be really good. He's very engaging uh, and very fun to listen to. So hopefully we will see you guys then.